Welcome to Courageous Conversations with Teresa W. Gamble, powered by Concierge Resource Professional Consultants. Courageous Conversations is a diversity, equality, and inclusion initiative. It's a gracious space for meaningful discussions about culture, life, business, work, learn, live, worship, and play. It's an audio encyclopedia designed to bridge cultures and generational gaps through active listening and action-oriented changes towards liberation for all. Are you looking for brand exposure? Join our sponsorship network for amazing benefits and perks. It's brand awareness at its best. Do you have a new product, service, or event that you want to promote? Email us at info at crpcnow.com. Thank you for tuning in to Courageous Conversations with Teresa W. Gamble, a diversity and racial equality show. Our storytelling guest today is Mr. Ernest Gamble Sr., a Jacksonville, Florida native, a professional industrial and administrative expert, author, entrepreneur, and a preacher's son. Our topic today is work life. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Gamble. Thank you for having me. What we're going to talk about today, we want to share the story about work. From your bio that I read that you've been working since you was in the seventh grade. What was your drive and your motiva- motivation for working since seventh grade up until this present day? Yes, I'm glad you asked. Um, for my childhood, my very early childhood, um, being interested in uh, wanting to play sports, um, want to do things um, in the neighborhood for sports and in school. And so um, those things took where you had to get a physical. And during that time and season, uh, my mother was um, a single parent, um, didn't have a clue, you know, what father was doing. You know, at that time that I learned later on in life that he wasn't my father, but um, but by mother being a single parent and everything and um, asking her to uh, support what I want to do uh, in sports in the neighborhood as well as in school. And then uh, reaching out to the ministry that I was a part of, um, um, asking for help and everything. And um, But the finance of that, you know, uh, reasoning why they couldn't do anything, uh, I was just told that they weren't able to do anything to help me. So that drive me to um, get out and cut yards and um, do little projects around the homes of the neighbors in their home and things like that. Um, also, growing up in the ministry, you know, you know, hanging with the deacons and different uh, men of the church, you know, they would do repair stuff. So I took those skill sets of things and um, I applied them to make money. So in order for me to pay for my physical, I applied myself to um, go to work and I had an opportunity uh, to be able to um, go to work um, for the uh, Red Caps of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I was able to work that summer and um, that gave me an opportunity. So when I got done, you know, working and everything like that and got ready for the sports for the next season, by the time that came around, I didn't think about playing sports anymore. Um, I did, um, had a desire still, but when I started working and I was making money and uh, making money just kept me from... um, you know, doing other activities or things I wanted to do that I was willing to pay for. So being in the seventh grade, that will put you around what age? About 13, 14 years old? Correct. So Correct. you wasn't uncomfortable working around grown people at that age? And what type of work did you start out doing in the seventh grade? Well, um, I was um, actually um, um, was comfortable working around grown folks because I was doing a lot of grown folks stuff in the body of Christ, um, you know, happened around the church, repairs, painting and stuff. And then at home itself, when mama needed things repaired. So I was very um, gifted and talented in a lot of my skill sets and things like that. And so those things kept me around grown folks, you know, they taught you how to stay in your place, you know, they taught you when to speak and things like that. But I wasn't afraid of work because I was very busy at a young age. Like that growing up and as well as in school. 
That's good. You understand, you said something about being in church. So are you a, a preacher's son? Well, my mother, um, as she was, um, as we was growing up and she got into, you know, in the church and then later on in life, she became a minister to preach and stuff like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the work that you did, um, since you didn't, your initial goal was to be able to pay for your physical for sports, yes. but your focus changed to just work in general. So what was your new goal working Go, moving from middle school to high school and then from graduation, what type of jobs did you have and what was the work culture like for you? Well, um, um, looking back on that point again, um, when I was coming up, um, because I had the mindset to work and make money, so it put me in the mindset to also be a um, business owner, you know, an entrepreneur, um, because I wanted to not only make money, but save money because, um, saving money allows you to be able to buy and have things that you want as you get older. But it also put me in a mindset to be a business owner because as I was growing up, you know, you go to the grocery store, you know, those are business owners. And, um, you know, and my, uh, the, the man that I thought that was my father, him and his father you know, was in Mason and uh, Brick Mason. And so, and you know, they work for people, but they didn't have the mindset to be their own person. But being around people in uh, in the neighborhood as well as church, you know, they had their own little business on the side, even though they work for people. So it draw that interest for me to be my own boss, you know. So I, I began to build things, you know, out of woods and things like that, and sell all type of special flower pots. I was able to repair and do things in electronics and stuff like that. So it just gave me my own initi initiative to um, be that person. But so by the time I got grown, when you know, when I got out of high school, um, I already be established to be that business owner. So even though you have the passion to own your business, you still work for other people as well, correct? Yes, 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 indeed. I did um, continue to work for people and uh, work on jobs and stuff like that. And as I um, began to work on jobs, I began to realize that how even working on job, I was finding out that uh, working on job wasn't all that it turned out to be. Um, uh, when I realized when I was dealing with something that I didn't understand as a child and we were talking about racism and discrimination and how that sometimes um, it won't promote you it, uh, or you won't get the money that um, white color people was getting um, or your peers um, um, and I learned that they were so caught up on sometimes my gifts and talent on what I can do at a productive rate versus, you know, hey, it's your time to move up or it's your time to, um, you know, get promoted and stuff or get raises. And so I had to work like two or three times harder. One of the biggest things I wanted to uh, definitely mention to you, Teresa, um, that I learned, they always say, I wish I had three or four people like you. You know, it ain't to really go get three or four people like you. It's for you to do three or four people jobs and you still won't get the benefits and and that and and I did not receive the benefits. I did not get the promotion because when I wanted to um, go up into another position or something like that, when they look at that and say, "Oh, you, if I had three or four people like you, look, <clears throat> they're not planning on promoting you. People are not planning on giving you that bonus, or they're not planning on giving you that raise." Because you are three or four people they don't have to hire. So that was a, a discrimination against me in my life. And I found that out to also be true in ministry, Teresa. Wow. And I learned this in ministry. When you are gifted in talent to do multiple things, they always say, whatever your hands find to do, do. And you're thinking that when they say that, it's for you to be able to be whatever God's calling you to be in your calling and things like that. But they actually took it. And they actually distribute it where, look, they don't have to go and use the people that who is ordained, who is called and working and supposed to do the job. They just go ahead on and, and have you to do it. And then, they, um, you know, they, sometimes we don't look at it as a discrimination against those that who are doing a lot in the church. But it is a discrimination. 
wow. because it won't promote you. And a lot of you, probably like myself today, you ain't ordained. And all they say is God say, uh, we're still waiting. Or they'll still overlook you, how that happened. They'll bring people in off the street who ain't been living nothing, who ain't been working in the church, who ain't been coming to church, who ain't paying tithe and offering. And when you see these things, um, develop and then you go to the leaders and say hey why you ain't giving you know what's what's wrong with me you know why I ain't getting promoted and then this happened on your regular jobs as well you know you go like hey I, I, I applied for that position you know I deserve the raise and stuff and then you training people and then they're getting promoted over you like that so how do you deal with being overlooked like that and you still producing the work and they're still benefiting you know, not just um, branding wise, but um, financial wise. How do you manage to deal and cope with that um, that type of um, neglect in being promoted and being compensated for what the work you're producing? Yeah, um, what I what I I learned for myself was first of all by me knowing who I am. They didn't birth my gifts and talent in me. Um, that come through where I learned how to pray and fast, um, read the Bible and stuff um, to encourage myself. Um, that comes from when you have to deal with um, things out of control. Um, I've learned how to do these things um, because I, I applied myself to a position on a job. I didn't come in to do everybody else's job. So I know who I was before I applied for that job. I know who I am before I applied that job. So my mindset is that in order for me to understand what I want to be in life as an entrepreneur or a business owner, have my own, um, and a lot of time, you, you know, you go to certain places, you know, you can learn trades in a company that has some um, attributes or some um uh, things that you wanted to be in life. And sometimes some of the company have uh, things that can help you enhance in your own business or your own self. But me applying myself to companies and, and ministry like that where they didn't see the value in me because, you know, uh, a lot of time they want your gifts and talent without giving you the respect that you honestly deserve. Wow. And that comes because they don't respect the mindset that you are a leader. Wow. See, in order for a good leader, you have to learn how to lead. By what? You have to learn the job. You got to learn the footwork. They always say you got to put the work in in order to see, you know, what your outcome is. And a lot of times we've been our bypass our outcome, not because it's our fault, it's because the people that's in leadership over us are afraid for us to move and grow because we may be somehow or another uh, intimidation to them. And we're not after their job. When you are a leader in a mindset like I was growing up to be, we're not after your job and your position because our own concept is we want our own. See, we want our own. And this also help us to treat people if someone come work for us or under us, we should know how to handle them. And so a lot of experience that we do get, you know, whether it's uncomfortable and it's racist or discrimination applied spiritually or naturally because it happened in both worlds to me. See, I was raised up in a house where, you know, um, first of all, I, I was already born with a um, slow learning disorder. And so you would think that with that process, you know, my mother would have sought help for me, right? And then that would have helped me have a lot of tools I needed, but that wasn't the case in my case. And so what that led to where um, I wasn't pushed into a lot of areas because when people think that when you have a a uh, uh, underlying disease or, or, or a disability where people can't see it. See, I didn't have a physical disability. But when I look at how people prosper off that, how? Because they know that a lot of time we have a lot of gifts and talent. 
So in knowing that you had this um, slow learning um, disorder mm -hmm. and you were very gifted with your hands, mm -hmm. you know, not just building things and, and work ethic, you also artistic, very creative. Yes. So what you're saying is that you wasn't valued in order to exploit those gifts and talents, which would have brought you additional monetary gain. Yes. So because you didn't have the support, how were you able to capitalize or what um, acknowledgement did you get for those gifts and talents? Well, um, the only way I got those acknowledgement of those gifts and talent, um, if it benefited those people I was doing the work for, as long as it was it was something for them to prosper by or uh, to gain um, um, compliments by uh, a lot of time. I didn't get the recognition, period, in, in the body of Christ as well as in the natural on uh, people's jobs. I did not get the recognition as long as I was doing it. It's like they'll keep you behind the scene. They don't want to really tell the people um, who, who said this, who wrote this, who drew this. Um, I was very articulate in drawing as well and writing and stuff like that. And so um, because I had a... Um, slow learner uh, disability but at the same time and here's where another point comes in at where the state and the government and the school they all profited off me but if I went wanted to go apply for any disability for this um, um, uh, SLD issue that I had that, that I was born with everybody made money off me everybody got their profit off me but me. So this happens to people when we look at discrimination or, 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 or some would say uh, sometimes it felt very strongly, um, they don't want to use this word a lot, racist and prejudice. So in other words, everybody, um, so other words, because everyone else gained off of your dis learning disability and your creativity and your work ethic. It caused you to even work harder, um, at least more than one job, as the cost of living went up. Of course, yes, it, it, it make you. It, it, it didn't leave you no choice but that you had to work hard. You had to study hard. I remember when I was young, Teresa, um, and we was in church, and one of the um, it was a prophet came and visit our ministry, and he got up to speak. And as he was speaking, he asked, "Can he speak to me? Can he minister to me?" And I'm not, and uh, gave him permission to do so. And as a child, he's told me that the Lord said He was going to um, bless me to be able to read better and stronger, and and, and to and to um, deal with this um, slow learning that I that I was born with. And he said, and what you needed to do for the answer for that was to, and the solution to help me with that. He said, God said that. You need to read the Bible. Now, there were some words, a lot of words that I couldn't uh, pronounce or say or spell. But one of the techniques that happened was when, when people got up to speak or read, I was able to follow that verse. And then those words that I wasn't familiar with, I didn't know how to spell. Then I went back home every day. Uh, uh, every day of my life, I began to read it, and then I began to pronounce it, and then I began to spell it. And so that's what actually helped me, and not only helped me just to read, uh, spell, and um, and to learn, but it also helped me even more in my desire to be that CEO, to be that boss man, and to how to go to a job and how to deal with this um, um, discrimination about. You know my gifts and talent and how it was being used by people and so it helped me to be able to when I do a job I do it one time and I do it at a professional level in other words when you get the compliment whether people didn't give it to me whether they didn't you know give me that uh, return to say hey thank you Mr. Gamble you know thank you Ernest for that you know I knew I was proud of what I'd done because my goal was to please God in whatever I did so I got my recognition from God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit in the faith that I believe in. And so that what really motivated me. That what really took me to the place where I am today. So, and that overflowed into the 
traditional workplace as yes. well as in ministry. And it's ironic how you compare, you know, work in the church and work in society. Yes. Some of the the challenges individuals face in both platforms when you're gifted and talented and they only value for what you can provide yes. but not compensate you for your time. Yes. And 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 even with that said uh, one of the things that you can recognize this in, in the body of Christ as well as the job, but I'm doing the body of Christ first. One of the things is that when you see a ministry where they have poured, uh, when when a child get ready to graduate, and this is an experience that I see all the time, and it's happening to this day. When a child get ready to graduate, the A and B honor roll students, congratulations to you all. Continue to keep that successful going. The church would set a budget aside or uh, come up with an offering and say, we're going to help them and give them a, um, give them a, um, a love offering or to help them with their tuition and things like that. Right. And so everybody cheers, everybody congratulate. But then what happened when you have people like myself who also went to school too? And then we turned around and we graduated too, right? And so, but you don't hear any type of promotion or any type of recognition for these students to help them to, with their tuitions and stuff like that and, and, and get them a love offering, anything like that. So you're not talking about the honor roll students. You're talking about uh, special education students. Yes, yeah, special education students. You know, and most times when they do things like that for, for students, they have a physical disability that is seen but the ones that don't have a physical disability like what I'm dealing with SLD and I guarantee you right now because as long as I don't visit many churches I am 55 today from the time I've been in ministry from my childhood I've never seen or heard a ministry okay promoted conditions that you can't uh, as a uh, uh, disability that you can't see to honor them to help them to go to college and so when we look at the job perspective, when you go to the job, the job are the same way. Most physical disability are get more noticing on how disability is supposed to look. When you get people on the job like myself who have a invisible disability, invisible um, disability, we do not get the promotion. We do not get recognized. There is no monetary support, right? And so the company is supposed to have all of these expectations and they'll say, hey, we have platforms that you can promote and get raises and all this stuff, right? So a lot of time we hide this disability, Teresa. And when we hide this disability because through our growth and, and, and our growing up, we see that this can play a part into them not looking at me that I can do the job, I can perform the job, and my gifts and talent should make room for me, right? But when they find out that you have these issues, then they'll really put the brakes on you. But when they find out that your gifts and talent, without knowing that the, the, uh, if you if you have a, so, a, a slow learning disability, then your gifts and talent would be the one that they'll put in place as put the brakes on you, no promotion, no raises, etc. So it's a major problem within our society, it's especially for a black colored man. And um, um, thank God that I was able to. Um, um, deal with a lot of these things through prayer and fasting because that's how these things works and for me as a colored man um, growing up knowing that I wanted to be a husband and a father and one of the things that I knew that I had confidence in myself was to know that when I graduated and before I got married I wanted to make sure that I have all my tools in place that means I have my house I have cars I can't. I, I didn't have a mindset to put a, a family before the foundation. There's an order to everything, right? 
and, and, and a lot of time my order when it came to promotion and how I was supposed to you know um, advance in life um, because I had a disability that many people knew about and instead of them looking at the work I put in the test that was given to me was real good in other words money invested um, you know my time was invested my skills the bill I mean from sheetrock brick mason plumbing um, you're talking about framework driving um, as a um, van driver um, for over 17 years, you're talking about um, ushering. Look, when we was in church growing up, we had to learn to do everything. And then I was doing jobs that people was already was signed to because they don't want to do it or they was lazy about doing it. On the job the same way. See, and, and, and you'll find this, you know, where, and then they'll try to partner you up with people who they know is sorry. So with all the experience you have endured from seventh grade, whether it's in the body of Christ, being a preacher's child, a preacher's son, mm -hmm. and to a professional industrial expert from warehousing, logistics, forklift operating, um, even customer service and banking, all those things that you have Substitute done. Substitute teaching. You know, mm -hmm. the different roles that you possess. Before um, we end this amazing storytelling moment, what advice would you give those people who, ha who have the decision-making power mm -hmm. and for those who have experienced what you experienced on what to do next in 60 seconds? Yeah, I can do that in very 60 seconds. First thing to start doing is stop being prejudiced. Stop being prejudiced to people who are doing the job versus somebody ain't doing the job Give them the opportunity to show themselves that they qualify to do it and quit putting um, pins and needles in them as if like they're not going to make a mistake. Everybody that does a job is going to make a mistake. They're going to do it, but you still hire them. You still promote them. Stop overlooking them when they put that time in, when they make your company look good for money and they look, make your company grow um, wealth and you get all these compliments and get all these ratings. Stop taking the advantage of those men and women and pay them for the value of what they work. Stop giving it to somebody who, did a, uh, who didn't do the work. Give them the 2% and give the other person the 10%. So what about the individual who falls in that category? What would you get? What advice would you give them? To, to, to work hard, continue to be, and know in your mind and your heart who you are. That's the bottom line. When you know who you are and you stand up for what you believe in and what is, is respect that you demand that people give you no matter what, whether you have a, 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 a disability or not, just know that you know who you are and you know what you're worth. And make it strong. And don't be afraid to voice your opinion. You don't have to yell and shout and cuss them out. Just let them know, hey, no, that was wrong. No, you didn't handle that right. And if you get managers and supervisors who want to feel like, or team leaders who want to just feel like they want to just write you up and just write you up and things like that, then say, look, I'm going to write you up too. Because why? Just like I'm valuable to this company, just like you valuable to this company, I'm valuable to this company too. So my life matters, my voice matters, my respect matters, and I know who I am. And I don't want to be controlled by being a slave to um, 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 disrespect. Thank you so much, Mr. Gamble, for that amazing story from an African-American man, Jacksonville native, been working since seventh grade middle school all the way to this present state in multiple industries, active participant and worker in the body of Christ until this day as well. I hope you was able to take some nuggets from this. I hope you were able to apply some best practices on how to treat those that you have overlooked, undermined, underserved, underpaid, and changed the narrative. We had a wake-up call this past summer. So these are some things and strategies how people feel but not willing and uh, capable to express. 
You've been listening to Courageous Conversations with Teresa W. Gamble. Courageous Conversations is powered by Concierge Resource Professional Consultants. And remember, do not get weary in well-doing. You shall reap if you faint not. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9.